Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for those students who need a review of the four important organic molecules. So my assumption is that you've already watched some Ed Puzzles over this. We have had a class discussion about this. So this is just a quick review of the four important organic molecules. Now, first things you're gonna need to know is, is how you build them. So quickly, let's take a look at that. I'm gonna scroll around here. For building to join two monomers, to ultimately build a polymer, that's gonna be a covalent bond, and that is done through dehydration synthesis or the condensation reaction. And what you're gonna to need to do is remove a, an OH from one of the monomers and an H from the other, pull that out, and you will form a water and a covalent bond. Now, that's only gonna be done with the assistance of an enzyme at any great rate. Um, the opposite of that is hydrolysis, that's to break a bond. So in order to break this bond here, we're gonna take a water molecule and that's gonna be the source of an OH for one and an H for the other to break that apart. And here you can see an enzyme. Um, this enzyme is called sucrase because it digests sucrose. This is what's called a disaccharide. It's two individual sugar units hooked together. And enzymatically, you can see this input of water right here and you're gonna break those bonds back down into the monomers. So when you look at these four important organic molecules, um, this is assuming that you have some complex organic molecule, but you wanna know what each is made out of individually. So carbohydrates ultimately are built out of sugars. So you could look at a sugar like this, right? And you can see all the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, but they can simplify it just to this as well. The same basic formula for carbohydrates is CH2O. That would be the empirical formula. You can hook two sugars together like we're doing here, two glucose molecules, and you can form a disaccharide. A monosaccharide is one sugar unit, a disaccharide is two. And then if you hook uh, several sugars together, then you would have a polysaccharide. So that would be a complex carbohydrate. Um, let me jump back at a couple other disaccharides. So you can see sucrose is like table sugar, lactose, and maltose. What do they all have in common? They all contain a glucose molecule, and they're paired with either another glucose or a galactose or a fructose in order to form these three common disaccharides. Now, polysaccharides, this is your carbohydrates. They have things in common. They don't dissolve well in water, and they're so large that they cannot, they don't have a way to pass through a cell membrane. They fall into two big jobs. They're either for storing energy or for building things, right? Now, you can hook um, sugars together, plants, not us, but uh, plants can hook sugars together um, and build a polysaccharide, and this is starch. We appreciate that because we eat a lot of foods with starch in them, right? Now, when you and I want to store sugars, we store it as something different. Uh, it's built slightly different, um, and this is called glycogen, and we usually store that in our liver, okay? So I'm going to jump back here. Polysaccharides, another name is carbohydrate. The monomer is sugar, okay? There are disacc disaccharides when you hook two together. Polysaccharides is a chain, multiple sugars, and we've just talked about energy storage. Another major function of polysaccharides is structural. So an example would be cellulose, plant cell walls. It's a bunch of sugar units hooked together in a way that we cannot, we don't have the enzyme to digest cellulose, right? We have to break those cell walls with our teeth. Um, another one is chitin. Chitin is what makes up fungal cell walls. It also makes up the exoskeletons of um, arthropods. All right, so what I would do, and what we've talked about in class, is be able to make a chart like this, where you keep track of the complex polymer, right? You talk about the monomer and then the polymer functions. So if I were going to do this, here I'm talking about carbohydrates, they are built with sugars, um, here are three monomers, here are three examples of disaccharides, and then here I have given you polymers and examples of functions. Now, how are these joined? How do you get more than one dehydration synthesis, right, is how you join it, how you break them apart, hydrolysis. Okay, now our second, okay, so let me jump back up here so we see where we're going. So now you should know all things carbohydrates. Now let's talk about all things lipids. So lipids are broken down into two main categories and they are fats and they are steroids. Now fats characteristic structure of a fat is going to be a single glycerol molecule with three fatty acid chains. These 
are abridged. They're very short. Normally they're 16 to 18 carbons long. So you know about hydrocarbons. When you have carbons with a bunch of hydrogens on it, they all share fare, right? And those tend to be what? Hydrophobic. And so every chain that you hook on here, and you're going to hook on three chains, you're going to form then three covalent bonds. So three water molecules, right? And this would be a fat. Okay, so glycerol and three fatty acid chains. Now, these fatty acid chains come in two categories, the fatty acid chains part, saturated and unsaturated. So when you look at a saturated fat, that means all the carbons in, you know, 16 to 18 carbons long in that fatty acid chain are all saturated with hydrogens. They form no double bonds. So therefore, they tend to have those type of fat, saturated fats stack really well and become a solid at room temperature. And this usually comes from animals. Unsaturated fats, these are the fatty acid chains where you have a double bond in it right here, which puts a little kink in the chain. And they don't stack well, so they tend to be a liquid at room temperature. And these are things like oils, and they would come from plants. Okay, so now I'm coming back here. Lipids, one of your important organic molecules, has two subcategories, fats and steroids. So we have just discussed fats. Now the second category, steroids. Okay, steroids are usually four rings of carbon, four rings of carbons joined, joined together. And the role, one of the roles, key roles, is they are hormones in our body. And um, this is testosterone and this is estrogen. Now, there are other things that fats do, but if your teacher asks, what are the two, or sorry, there are other things that lipids do, but if your teacher asks, what are the two main categories of lipids, you're going to say fats and steroids. All right. Now you have modifications of those, like you have things like phospholipids, where one of the chains is removed from a fat and instead it is replaced with a phosphate um, group. And so now it has this polar hydrophilic um, head and then these hydrophobic tails and a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of that makes up our cell membrane. OK, you could have other modifications as well. Okay, so you could have uh, waxes, um, which help uh, protect uh, loss of water, let's say on a plant, okay? That would be another, another function. Um, here I can show you wax. It's a long chain fatty acid with a uh, long chain alcohol with just an OH group, all right? So th that's just an example. Waxes and phospholipids are, are derived from fats. Now remember, Back here, okay, fats, right? It's gonna be glycerol with three long fatty acid chains. That's the typical structure um, of a fat and the typical structure of a steroid is four rings together. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the summary table as I would put it. So I'd say the second important organic molecule are lipids. Here are your two categories, fats and steroids. Fats, you have glycerol, and long fatty acid chains that could either be saturated or unsaturated, and steroids or four rings of carbon together. And here I have given you examples and how they are used. Okay, that's two down. Okay, now our third one would be proteins. Now, proteins have so many important functions. You can see here as messengers and antibodies and enzymes. So they have a lot of important functions and it's really important that you know their structure and you know it a little bit more detailed than you do the other two. That will be the expectation. But all proteins are built out of amino acids. So if I asked you the monomer of a protein, you would say amino acid, okay? So that, if it, you should be able to draw one of these, no problem. You have a central carbon. So you know carbon likes to make four bonds. So you can see four lines coming off. You have a carboxyl group. This is sometimes called the C terminus N, C for carboxyl. Okay, this is the N terminus N. Um, you've got a hydrogen and you have an R group. There are over 20 different R groups. They're all highlighted here in blue. Okay, and depending on what is in that R group um, will depend if it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Typical ones that are hydrophilic are things that have charges on them or an exposed oxygen or nitrogen off the end. Okay, Hydrophobic are ones that typically are a lot of carbons and hydrogen and the sulfur, the nitrogen is to the interior of that R group. All right. So you need to know amino acids are the monomers of all proteins. Now, when you join them together, 
that specific process. You join, always add to the C terminus end. Okay, so here's your C terminus end, right? And you're adding on, pretend like this is a long chain. You're adding on this, this new amino acid right here, you're adding it right here. Again, dehydration synthesis, an OH and an, and an H, and you're forming this um, covalent bond. It's got a specific name when it is in um, proteins, and it's called a peptide bond, and that's between this carbon and this nitrogen. Now, when you talk about the structure of a protein, you don't, it's, it's just like we had different structures, whether you made starch or cellulose or chitin, right? Proteins are the same. When you get a long chain, it's the what happens to that long chain. The way it's arranged is going to determine its functionality. So you refer to that as its primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So the primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. So you would just name each one of these amino acids, right, of the 20. The secondary structure, this is a usually um, – it, it has – it has nothing to do with the R groups. It has everything to do with this N terminus and C terminus N. The C terminus N, let me jump back to an amino acid so you can see it. Um, here we go. So the C terminus N tends to have a negative charge because the hydrogen that would sit here, you can see it's right over here. So the amino, um, amino um, N terminus end of an amino acid has a positive charge. The carboxyl group has a negative charge. So when it relaxes, it relaxes into one of two secondary structures, either a beta pleated sheet where it's kind of like an accordion folded back on itself or an alpha helix, okay, where it's in a spiral. That's its secondary structure. It has nothing to do with R groups, has everything to do with hydrogen bonds and the interactions between different amino acids. Now, the tertiary structure is the folding pattern imposed upon the secondary structure, and that has everything to do with R groups. So the hydrophilics are going to want to be together, and the hydrophobics are going to want to be together. And the quaternary structure is when you have more than one chain and you have joined those together. All right? So again, looking at the third important organic molecule, proteins, here's your monomer, amino acids. And know that on this summary chart, you still need to know how they're joined and you need to know about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. You need to know all of that, right? And here are just some polymer examples with their functions, things, how they use in our body, how they're used. All right, the fourth important organic molecule are nu nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are always built out of nucleotides, okay? Now, that is the monomer, but there's three components to this monomer, right? So you have a nitrogenous containing base. There are five of those. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine are all found in uh, DNA, okay? And if you look right here, here in the nitrogenous bases, you've got adenine, you've got thymine, you've got guanine and cytosine. But instead of thymine, you have uracil in RNA. So we have a total of five nitrogenous bases to choose from for this spot, but you have a total of four in DNA and a total of four in RNA. Okay, so the, the one differing one is you have thymine in DNA and you have uracil in RNA. Then you have a pinto sugar. So this sugar, notice it's this five carbon sugar. Here is carbon one next to the nitrogenous base. You can't go up on the roof because there's oxygen. Down here is two, three, four, and the chimney would make five. Okay, this five carbon sugar is either going to be deoxyribose in DNA or it will be ribose in RNA. Okay, so the sugars are different. And then the third component of the monomer is a phosphate group. Okay, so this is the brick that builds the wall of nucleic acids. As far as examples of nucleic acids, you have DNA. RNA and ATP, and I'll uh, differentiate between those. So here is DNA. DNA is a double helix. It's two chains of nucleotides twisted together to form this helical structure. Patterns you want to know. Adenine is always bound to thymine, and guanine is always bound to cytosine. Notice both adenine and guanine are what's called purines. They have two rings in their nitrogenous base whereas thymine and cytosine are called primidines and they only have one ring. So you always have a purine connected to a primidine. And in this case, it is always adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine in DNA. Let me show you another picture of that. Here are your three pyrimidines, single ringed nitrogenous bases. Here are your two purines, double ringed nitrogenous bases, okay? 
Now in RNA, it's single-stranded. The sugar instead is going to be ribose instead of deoxyribose. You will see the absence of thymine and in its place. Sorry, it, I couldn't hear what you said. That's my watch talking to me. I don't know why. Um, in its place, you have uracil. So here's a little chart where you can compare and contrast DNA with RNA. Now, this is a great diagram, okay? Don't be wigged out about it, okay? This identifies that they put both purines on this side and both primidines on this side, okay? So you can see that. You can see there are three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. There are two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine, and that is consistent, okay? You have the outside um, is a phosphate sugar backbone. So here you can see phosphate sugar right? Phosphate, sugar, that's your backbone over here. Phosphate, sugar, pho or sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Then um, your rungs of the ladder are these nitrogenous bases. Now look at these sugars. Do you see how it looks on the left-hand side where the houses are up, right side up on this side? Um, they're upside down. So they're anti-parallel. Now there is a numbering system. I'm going to point it out to you here, right? Remember we looked at the carbon number one, actually, let me get you a better picture. Carbon number one is the one that's connected to the nitrogenous base. So one, two, three. If this were a house, the door would be right here, right? Three, four, and the chimney makes five. So when we look back here, okay, this would be carbon one connected to this nitrogenous base. Two, three, four, and this chimney up here makes five, so it's called the five prime end. If we were peering, if our eyes were down here, here's carbon one connected to the nitrogenous base, two, three, we're at the three prime end, right? So the other one runs the other way, anti parallel. You can see it looks like the houses are upside down. So here's carbon number one connected to the nitrogenous base. Here's oxygen, so we can't go that way. Two, three, four, and here's the chimney right here at the five prime end right? And opposite up here. So that's important. And we'll talk more about that later, but I want you to start learning about it now. So DNA, you have RNA, and then your third example would be ATP. ATP is the nitrogenous base adenine. It is the sugar ribose, and together those are called adenosine. And then it has three phosphates attached to it. And these these bonds between the second and third phosphate right here, if it is broken, it will release about 7.3 kilocalories of energy. And ATP is the dollar bill of our cells. It's what we spend to construct things and transport things within um, and synthesize things um, within our body. So that would be ATP. Okay, so here um, is the last one, nucleic acids. Here is the monomer, okay? Here it's giving you the, the DNA, RNA, and ATP. Those are your examples. So if you are asked to describe the monomers of any one of these four important organic molecules, they are listed here. The monomer of carbohydrates, another name, polysaccharide. The monomer is glucose or a monosaccharide or a single sugar unit, right? Whereas lipids, you have two categories of lipids, right? You've got fats, and those are built out of glycerol and three fatty acid chains or steroids, which are made out of four rings, right? So that's really, you can't really say there's a monomer per se because there's multiple things to build those. But you need to know fats are built out of glycerol and fatty acid chains. Those could be saturated or unsaturated. Steroids are four rings. Here are some examples. Proteins always built out of amino acids. There are 20 options on your amino acids because there are 20 excuse me, 20 R groups, and you need to know about how they're built, the peptide bond, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure, and here are some examples, and nucleic acids, the monomer for building those are nucleotides, and you need to be able to diagram that, just a simple diagram, and um, be able to talk about the variations in the nitrogenous bases, the variation um, in the sugar, phosphate is the only thing that's the same, and then you could be able to compare and contrast DNA, RNA, and ATP. Okay, so hopefully that was not overwhelming. I wanna re-remind you that this was a video intended just to review a previous discussion, and um, hopefully uh, you're feeling good about all of it and you're having a great day.